So, um, yeah, it's, it's a pleasure to, uh, to talk to you about SI joints. Um, you know, I, when I usually come to this course, I usually talk about scoliosis. Um, but uh, but I, I wanted to do something different to, uh, this year, so so I figured we talk about SI joints is sort of a new pet subject for me. Um, so uh, so SI joint pain is is common, um, and uh, it's it's uh, I think even though we talk about it a lot, it still might be unrecognized uh, or less. It's not as commonly recognized as it should be. Um, so. I'm going to start out with a case uh, just to sort of uh, show you my introduction to the recognition of SI joint disease and and sort of sort of my wake up call. Um, so this is a uh, in, two, in the year 2015. It was a 49 year old woman who was having some low back pain. I was having some uh, radicular pain that was mostly in the L5 S1 distribution. She had a, a slightly collapsed disc space at L5-S1, some moderate foraminal stenosis at L5-S1. And so I thought, okay, well, this might be a good patient for a standalone ALIF. So that's what we did, a standalone ALIF, and her pain did not get better. So I thought to myself, oh, well, maybe she has micromotion uh, due to the fact that it was a standalone ALIF. Maybe she needed more uh, support and uh, and so I did a posterior fusion L5-S1 uh, with bilateral wide open foraminotomies. Her pain got worse. So finally she came back to clinic with a very robust and solid L5-S1 construct, both anterior and posterior. And I realized, oh my gosh, she has SI joint pain. And so uh, perhaps that's what she had at the very beginning. Uh, and, and I failed to, to recognize it. And, and uh, the only reason why it came to mind was because of uh, these articles uh, from 2015 and 16, the randomized controlled trial of uh, the uh, uh, triangular um, implants to secure the SI joint together, uh, effectively demonstrating that uh, SI joint pain improved uh, pretty significantly with, with uh, SI joint fusions. And so seeing this, this uh, literature in the, uh, in the uh, Red Journal uh, so, sort of serves as the, as the basis for me to recognize that, that this patient uh, uh, had SI joint pain. And so she underwent an SI joint fusion and, uh, and her pain uh, resolved. Um, so so uh, it was, um, that, was, that was my wake up call and introduction into SI joint fusions and SI joint pain and how it can be uh, misdiagnosed or, or mis, mis or, or sort of hidden uh, uh, in, in light of the fact that it, it crosses and overlaps with L5S1 symptoms. So we're going to go over a variety of the anatomical aspects of the SI joint. Uh, it's, it's held together by ligaments, uh, both ventrally and dorsally. Uh, and uh, it's a broad network of ligaments. Um, so despite the presence of all these ligaments, it still does move uh, to only a small degree. Um, there, there is a significant amount of, of vascular anatomy that surrounds the SI joint. The superior gluteal artery is, is close by, so it's something to be aware of uh, when doing an MIS SI joint fusion and you get arterial blood. SI joint motion uh, is uh, in in multi, is a multiplanar uh, uh, entity. Uh, uh, so there's nutation and counternutation uh, showing how uh, it can sort of have this sort of twisting like uh, uh, motion as well as uh, sacral translation. And there's up to two, up to uh, four degrees of of uh, of motion in 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 the different planes. Um, the SI joint, it turns out, is very highly innervated. It's a sensitive structure. SI joint patients often have exquisitely sensitive pain, uh, probably even more severe than the pain you would see in a patient who had L5S1 disease. So if you have a patient who has L5S1-like symptoms, 
and the pain is like exquisite and really severe, uh, you should, you got to make sure that they don't have SI joint pain uh, because there's a, a tremendous amount of, uh, of innervation and nociception uh, in the vicinity of the SI joint. So uh, it's been demonstrated that when you uh, induce mechanical stimulation of the SI joint, uh, you can uh, create uh, pain. And so that's the basis for which we get SI joint injections um, to, in order to uh, test and uh, reduce pain temporarily. So it's uh, because uh, it is so highly innervated, uh, it is recognized that the SI joint pain is a significant pain generator. Uh, and, uh, and there are various stimuli that we can uh, evaluate to uh, help uh, develop that diagnosis. It turns out that uh, SI joint pain is very prevalent. Uh, about uh, 15 to 30 percent of low back pain patients uh, actually do carry uh, a diagnosis of SI joint pain when carefully examined. And uh, when you have a patient who has had a previous lumbar fusion, uh, the percentage of patients who have low back pain uh, that is caused by SI joint discomfort, uh, that goes up even, uh, even higher, up to 43 patients of pa uh, up to 43 percent of patients who have uh, uh, a lumbar fusion also have coexisting SI joint pain or develop SI joint pain sometime after the lumbar fusion. So uh, it's been well demonstrated that uh, there is an increased rate of SI joint degeneration on CT scans uh, uh, five years uh, after uh, fusion. Um, so something, uh, again, to note is that you should be on heightened alert uh, if you have a patient who has a, a, uh, a fusion that, go, that goes down to the sacrum, uh, or even a patient who has had a fusion that involves pelvic fixation, these patients can still get SI joint pain. Um, in the grand scheme of things that are debilitating, you can see that SI joint pain uh, carries with it a severe uh, amount of, uh, of uh, diminishment of quality of life. Um, so if you look over here, uh, th th these are things like Parkinson's disease and ankylosing spondylitis. Those are the, 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 the worst ones, but SI joint pain uh, uh, is similar to chronic uh, obstructive pulmonary disease and the degree to which it impairs quality of life. So. Uh, it is a pretty profound amount of, uh, of uh, diminishment in, in quality of life when, when, uh, when SI joint pain is present. So uh, it's, it's important to be able to diagnose SI joint pain. Uh, the, S, the, SI, the sacrum is kind of like the keystone of the spine. Um, it's, it's, it serves as the basis for the spine, and it's triangularly shaped and that imposes forces on the SI joint that the ligaments uh, need to withhold. And if you have defective ligaments or overburdened ligaments, uh, the SI joint uh, can, can certainly create pain. It's important to realize that there are other issues that we commonly see in spine surgery, uh, and these are uh, issues that can very much uh, mimic uh, SI joint pain. Um, so if you have disc disease or facet disease, or if you have hip joint uh, uh, pathology, um, uh, sometimes it can be difficult to distinguish between these different uh, entities. And there is often a, a, a referral uh, type of distribution of that pain, uh, and it may coincide with a distribution of the S1 nerve root uh, and, uh, and that's why it can be, it can be kind of uh, tricky. And I think that's why it's, it's controversial. Uh, it's because uh, the d diagnostic uh, nature of the disease process is not, not easy. So uh, there are three primary groups of patients that have uh, SI joint disease. Uh, perhaps uh, one of the ones that as spine surgeons that we should be very aware of uh, uh, is the post-lumbar fusion uh, 
uh, population. You know, we do our own lumbar fusions and we therefore create adjacent segment disease. Uh, the SI joint is the adjacent segment and something for us to be uh, on heightened alert for. Um, for patients who have not had a previous lumbar fusion, uh, but who have been subjected to trauma, uh, SI joint pain uh, is not unusual. Uh, trauma is a very common part of the history in a patient who has SI joint pain. Uh, furthermore, uh, a postpartum patient uh, who went through a difficult labor uh, is at risk of disrupting the ligaments that support the SI joint and therefore SI joint pain is more common in, in females than males. So uh, like I mentioned earlier, there is overlapping uh, pain referral patterns and you gotta tease out the, the nuances of the pain to get an understanding of what is SI joint pain and what is not. And so uh, a, a typical situation with a patient who has an SI joint pain is a, a traumatic event where there was some kind of lifting or twisting, uh, some kind of uh, excessive force. Uh, a patient who has had a previous uh, uh, iliac harvest, I see that quite commonly as a cause of SI joint pain. Sometimes when you're doing a thorough dissection and, and exposure of your S1 entry point, you violate some of the ligaments that support the SI joint, and that can be a precursor to the, to the development of SI joint pain after a lumbar fusion. So these patients uh, have a variety of, of complaints, uh, but I, I, what I found to be most apparent uh, is that often there's a groin pain associated with it, as well as a buttocks pain and a referred radicular type pain that could be confused with L5S1 radiculopathy. Um, these patients often sit uh, in a way that suggests that they don't want to load that SI joint. You know, if they're sitting in your clinic, they're often going to be sitting on the side uh, that doesn't hurt. Um, they're going to be sparing uh, the side that 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 hurts. They're, uh, they're, sometimes they'll be sitting in an armchair and they'll be using their arms to off-weight the amount of axial loading of the, of the SI joint. So you can usually get an idea uh, just based on how the patient looks, uh, whether or not they have an SI joint uh, problem. The Fortin finger test is a test where uh, you ask the patient to point to the part of their back that hurts, and if they point to the vicinity of the PSIS, uh, that's, that's a positive Fortin finger test. Um, th there are a variety of different provocative tests, uh, and, uh, and you need to, uh, uh, in order to have an accurate uh, diagnosis of SI joint pain, you need to test your patients. Uh, you can test them with distraction, compression, a positive thigh thrust, the Gainsland uh, test, and the Faber test. Uh, th so, so all of these are are uh, different pro provocative tests um, that that uh, that are important to know how to do, so that you can be a good clinician. Kojo. Charlie, when do you stop? Like, I'm doing a distraction test. The patient's screaming. Do I, <laughs> do I go in with all five to, to to get positive tests? On? Well, you know, you, you, you should do uh, all, as many of them as you can do in a reasonable manner without the patient being too compromised because in order for these to get authorized by insurance companies, um, you need to have evidence that they have, uh, I think I, f I forgot the policies of the different companies, but like Aetna, for instance, I think you need to have at least three out of the five tests being positive. You know, so so uh, so that's one of the one of the criteria is you need to have demonstration that there is uh, more than one test that was positive. It's important that uh, as a surgeon, you, 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 if somebody is significantly pain when you study these tests, is to pause. I, I, most of us come from history, physical, and then look at the images to pause and look at the images to make sure you're not literally. Uh, ex exacerbating a fracture that's in the pelvic, sacral pelvic region. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Out of those five tests, is there one 
is there one that's more, most sensitive? So there's a sequence that you would do it in. We know that distraction is going to be dictated, so you do it last. You, you know, I, I, uh, I, I, I like to to do all of them, um, but I probably, the, the easiest ones uh, are, the, this distraction is pretty simple and fast. Uh, the, uh, the, the Gainsland's test, that's the most complicated because the patient's leg has to be hanging off the table, and then you have to sort of push that leg down while you uh, push the flexed uh, thigh, you know, in the other direction. That, that one's kind of like the most involved. A Faber test or a positive Patrick sign, you know, that's that's something can be that can be easily tested and it's pretty quick. The thigh thrust is also a little bit involved in terms of testing, but none of them take that long. Um, you know, you can do them uh, pr pretty easily, and and you know, you can actually uh, Google, um, you know, a YouTube and and. Uh, and and see see videos of them. It literally takes seconds to do these tests. So once you have a history that's consistent with SI joint disease and a uh, physical examination that's consistent with it, the next thing to do is a injection. Um, so uh, injections uh, can confirm the test or can confirm the diagnosis. Uh, and if you get a positive response to, uh, uh, from the injection, um, that further confirms uh, the, the, the diagnosis. Um, you want to test the patients before and after the injection. It's important to talk to your pain management doctor who's going to be doing these injections to make sure that they're doing a pre and post injection evaluation because you know, I don't do my own injections. And therefore, I, I don't really see the patient during that immediate post-injection period. Sometimes the, you, you'll get a patient uh, who gets the injection, and, and you ask them, oh, how did the injection go? Did it help you? And they say, oh, no, it didn't do anything for me. And, and then you ask them, well, did it help you for two hours? And then they'll say, oh, yeah, I felt great for two hours. So, so then, because there's this misunderstanding that they think the injection is therapeutic. It's really not. It's diagnostic. Um, so and sometimes it can be therapeutic, but, but most of the time it's diagnostic. And so, so it's important to, to tease out whether or not the patient actually derived benefit from the injection, because it could be very short-lived. And they'll usually tell you that it did not help them at all, when the reality of the situation is that it did, but it was just very transient. So if you have greater than 50% reduction of pain versus 75% uh, reduction of pain, that, those are considered to be the thresholds uh, that are significant in terms of uh, demonstrating uh, benefit. Um, so uh, these, these are uh, numbers that different insurance companies utilize to authorize surgery. Um, so it depends on the policy of the insurance company. Some of them uh, will require 75% pain relief. Um, so it, it does uh, depend on, on who the payer is. So uh, there's a continuum of uh, treatment. Uh, it starts out with medications, then physical therapy, uh, external bracing, uh, followed by uh, 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 SI joint injections with possible radiofrequency ablations. Uh, the radiofrequency ablations don't last very long, uh, and the injections don't traditionally last very long. And so ultimately, if you do have a positive injection, you can try doing a radiofrequency ablation, but sometimes those are very difficult to get authorized by insurance companies, and it may even be easier to get a SI joint fusion authorized. So uh, PT has been shown to help uh, with a good number of patients, uh, a good percentage of patients. So it, it definitely is important for the patient to have PT before you do uh, an SI joint fusion and or uh, other, uh, other advanced uh, technique. Um, so injections have been shown to help, uh, but they're, again, they're, they're short-lived. The duration of, leaf, of relief uh, is, in this study was anywhere from one to 58 months. Um, so sometimes SI joint pain resolves on its own. Um, so so you, you gotta watch your patient and not operate on everybody and see whether or not these conservative treatment strategies uh, uh, you know, get get uh, allow for adequate uh, relief. 
So uh, radio frequency ablation is depicted here is, is relatively short-lived, whether it's through uh, a, a cautery or a cooled uh, radio frequency ablation. And uh, so surgical treatments uh, can be both open and minimally invasive. Uh, depicted here is a minimally invasive SI joint uh, uh, fusion. Uh, open SI joint fusions are more uh, uh, difficult to recover from uh, and are not as commonly performed. Uh, however, uh, in the setting of a long construct, uh, when you have a lot of access to the SI joint, it may be reasonable to consider doing that if the patient has concomitant uh, SI joint pain. So uh, randomized clinical trial data shows that uh, the, the SI joint uh, fusion patients were shown to be superior to uh, non-surgical management. And this was a sustainable difference uh, versus non-surgical management. And there is a longer year follow-up, five-year follow-up that demonstrates it's a sustainable, uh, sustained uh, improvement uh, in terms of of benefit, um, so so uh, so not only is it a long-term sustained benefit, uh, but it's rapid improvement. You know, patients uh, often uh, get uh, dramatically better immediately uh, or very soon after the surgery. So you can get a uh, a sub substantial uh, 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 relief uh, very quickly. So uh, I know I'm I'm running low on on time. So a uh, bottom line, it's important to increase the, your recognition of SI joint pain as a real thing uh, to look for. Uh, uh, as spine surgeons, we're going to see patients with SI joint pain. We're going to be seeing patients w who don't have SI joint pain to begin with and develop it as a result of the surgery that, uh, that you did. If you follow your patients long enough, uh, you will see SI joint pain for sure. Uh, and if you uh, diagnose your patients properly uh, you, and do a careful exam, you will diagnose it. Um, so different strategies, you know, th this is a minimally invasive uh, SI joint fusion, um, different ways to do it. They have the triangular shaped uh, spacers, uh, screws. Uh, this is a patient who had an L4 to S1 fusion. Or, or L5 to S1 fusion who developed SI joint uh, disease. Uh, he had SI joint disease despite the presence of the pelvic screw. So this uh, was done to help support uh, the SI joint uh, uh, from a lateral approach. Um, this is a patient who had a L4 to S1 fusion and then kept on getting adjacent segment disease and went up and up and up. And so she ended up needing SI joint fusions. These fusions failed. Uh, so ultimately, what was needed was an open SI joint arthrodesis with bilateral uh, pelvic screws. Um, so so it just important to make sure that you know that uh, patients uh, develop SI joint pain commonly. Uh, and, uh, and that's all I've got. Uh, this is uh, a reminder that the Spine Summit is going to be February 21st uh, to the 24th. Uh, in Las Vegas. Any questions? Yes. Chris, Kristen? Charlie, thanks for a great talk as always. Just wondering your experience with SI joint pain in patients with uh, sagittal malalignment, if you find that it's a higher incidence and if that often goes undiagnosed because someone's focusing just on the SI joint. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I, I think sagittal malalignment puts a strain on, on the ligaments that support the SI joint. Um, I, I think that it is possible, let's say for instance, the, if you have a patient who has uh, a, a L45 uh, kyphotic disc base and they have symptoms that are related to L45, um, but, but they also happen to also have SI joint pain, I'd be tempted to correct the L45 problem, get them more sagittally balanced, and then see if their SI joint pain goes away. I have seen that before. Um, so, so, uh, so it's definitely important to take the sagittal balance into consideration because if you do correct the balance, the SI joint pain can improve. Dr. Chua. 
Yeah, Charlie, great talk uh, as always. I I've tried so hard in my career to figure this out, work with a single pain doctor, you know, to try to get some consistency, and I still have a hard time picking my patients. Having said that, I want to know what have you learned that you can tell us about what do you do when it fails? What's the revision strategy for a failed SI joint fusion? Because as I teach my residents, you need to start thinking about what the failure looks like and how you're going to fix it before you do the first operation. Right. So, so this, this is an example of a failure. Um, so in this circumstance, um, what I did was uh, take the, we have a Mazur robot, and I used the robot to guide my trajectories to the screws where, how, in terms of where and how they were inserted to make it easy to take them out. And then when those screws were removed, I used the robot to create a trajectory that guided me to the SI joint itself in the plane of the SI joint and use the drill from the robot to drill the cartilage out uh, within the SI joint, very similar to Dr. Cross's technique, but, but a little different because this was from a medial to lateral trajectory. Um, and so once you core out the cartilage using the trajectory determined by the robot, um, then I take a funnel and pack bone uh, into that area where the cartilage was removed, and then I'll put in my my you know standard pelvic screws. 